Sometimes, a single photo can capture a moment that baffles and intrigues us. If we turn back the hands of time, we see some mysterious photos that challenge our understanding of the past and make us wonder what really happened behind the scenes. From Hudson Valley UFOs to Jack the Baboon, here are 10 rare historical photos that scientists cannot explain. Number 10. Boren City's Virgin Mary Many residents of Boren City gather around an area where students claim to have seen the Virgin Mary various times. They sat at the viaduct, waiting for Mary to appear. It had been just the day before when students allegedly saw her around their school, not far from where the citizens were seated. During 1932 and 1933, sightings of the mother were on the rise. In two of Mary's apparitions, she appeared to the students, delivering simple messages that were incredibly profound. In the Burren village, she appeared 33 times from the 29th of November, 1932 to the 3rd of January the following year. Mary encouraged visitors to be good and pray regularly. Mary had featured in Fatima during the First World War, and Burren had occurred a few years prior to the Second World War. During this time, Burren was a sanctuary where many flocked for prayer. The mother has also revealed her heart as being golden, and during her apparitions at Fatima in 1917, she asked that the scholars pray for peace and emphasized her devotion to her immaculate heart. In the descriptions of the woman when she appeared, she was always said to be smiling. Almost two weeks following the Burren apparition, she was spotted again eight times from the 15th of January to the 2nd of March in 1933. It was believed that these sightings were made up, but such doubts would soon subside. The events that occurred in Burren could be viewed similarly to that of the continuation of Fatima, except this time as the renewal of the message of the Lord. Mary had revealed herself in a similar-looking dress as she had in Lourdes, and she had also dedicated a spring of water for healing. The water, in this case, already existed and was not made from nothing. In these sightings, the woman had stated that she'd come to relieve the sick and wished to relieve suffering. She wanted the citizens to have faith in her. It was after these various sightings that gatherings around the village increased as they waited for the apparition to reappear, as it had done so various times previously. In one of her appearances, Mary's knees could be seen moving beneath her robe, and her feet were obscured by clouds. Others described her as being clothed in a long white dress, decorated with a white veil and a golden crown of light. Her hands were positioned before her chest in a gesture of prayer. The initial series of sightings in Burren was recognized as authentic in 1949, and it became a celebrated day each year. In 1949, Father Joseph Deber of LEL, Massachusetts, founded the PR Maria Committee to spread the story of Mary's 33 appearances. He made use of pamphlets and tours to spread the message and worked closely with the Marian Library. Deborah and Don Shai were awarded the Marian Library Medal in 1958 for their book entitled Our Lady of Burren. He was also responsible for translating documents from Bishop Arrow and obtained permission to publish them in the Marian Library publication Marin Retz. In the 1970s, the committee would go on to donate to the library, which included three binders of photographs, holy cards, and various pictures that documented history and activities related to the apparitions. The photographs included a mix of originals that members had taken during pilgrimages to the shrine in the 1950s and 1960s, as well as reproductions of images that were taken around the time of the initial appearances in 1932 and 1933. Number 9. Hudson Valley UFOs Randy Eating was said to be the photographer who took this strange image of some unexplained lights that were seen above Putnam County back in 1987. The quietness of New York's Hudson River Valley is home to both retirees and upscale professionals who tend to be well-educated people. It would come as a shock to find that this town was subjected to UFO fever between 1983 and 1986. More than 5,000 residents had reported seeing several UFOs in the area. These reports were dismissed as a hoax, but many maintain what they saw. It was excused to be a group of stunt pilots, but some residents stated that certain events could not have been the work of standard airplanes. Pictured here was the image taken by eating of lights that formed a disc shape, leading to the belief that it was a flying saucer. On the 17th of March in 1983, Dennis Sant, who had worked for the government for 17 years, spotted a large object near his home in Brewster, New York. Dennis described it as a metallic glider that flew very silently. Its lights were bright and iridescent and appeared like a city of lights. He and his family followed the object to the backyard, and he soon became frightened with thoughts of the craft landing and that they would be abducted by these extraterrestrials. They were not the only ones who had seen such extraordinary light formations. Just a few miles out, the traffic on Interstate 84 had stopped as the drivers became mesmerized by some lights overhead, and this was just the start of the Hudson Valley sightings. A week after this, an officer for the Newcastle Police, Andy Sadoff, embarked on a routine patrol when he came across a curious event. 
The officer had been in the process of setting up to catch some speeding cars, but had been interrupted by a series of lights. Initially, Sadoff thought it was a plane, but soon realized it was much larger. There had been mostly white lights, but there was also the presence of green colors. It hovered up to the patrol car, but the officer did not appear afraid and was actually in awe of what he was seeing. Another thing that grabbed his attention was that the aircraft was making no noise, no humming, not a single sound. Only seconds later, another eyewitness was logged at the same time. A computer engineer named Ed Burns was on his way home on the Taconic Parkway, just a few miles north of where Sadoff was located. Burns suddenly received a whole lot of static on his radio and thought he was on the wrong number, but when he looked up, he saw a triangular-shaped ship as large as a football field. Again, it made no noise. The engineer pulled over and joined another group of motorists on the roadside, all of them staring at the sky. The documented reports all indicated that the unidentified object was moving very slowly in a northern direction over the Hudson River Valley. Ten minutes later, another 20 motorists saw it near Millwood, and after that, the police station in Yorktown began receiving various reports. The officers, however, stated that they looked like airplanes and not extraterrestrial aircraft. This was not the case in 1986 for Robert Levine either, who was a recent graduate from the Culinary Institute. While on his way home from the St. Andrew's Cafe one evening, Robert saw a curious sight of what he initially thought to be a low-flying helicopter. The enigmatic object appeared to be varying in size, and colorful lights circulated around it. With each blink of an eye, the ship changed from bigger to smaller or from closer to further away. Rob also recalled there not being any sound at all. He recalled that the colors seemed to change shape. It would sometimes look like unknown letters. There was also a light emitting from the object that seemed to be going from the ground up instead of from the object down. While the man's brother believed Rob was having a tipsy vision initially, he soon changed his position when he learned that during the 80s and early 90s, the area was a UFO hotspot. Number 8. Beryl Petty. This image is a scene from the Scottish Highlands. It was taken from the top of a hill where Beryl Petty, a hill walker from Yorkshire, had spotted a UFO. She was accompanied by her husband, Len, who had unfortunately missed seeing the object by the time Beryl had gathered her thoughts. On the 30th of June in 1981, the Press and Journal had published an article headed Hill Walker Claims UFO Sighting in Sutherland. It detailed that a large silver disc, which left a golden trail, had swooped directly across the clear sky to land on the 800-foot hill that Beryl and Len had been walking on at noon. The woman was an ex-wartime WAAF as well as a former employee of the Air Ministry's meteorological office and maintained that what she had seen was not a balloon nor an aircraft. None of these suggestions quite captured what she had seen that day. The article detailed that she was from Narrow Lane, Harden close to Bingley. She was interviewed at her holiday address located in Sutherland. She described that they heard no sound coming from the craft and were expecting a noise consistent with that of an explosion, but there was not even a murmur. Beryl also thought that there would be some burning due to the speed of the unidentified object, but there was nothing, not even the smell of smoke. Len, an ex-army man, explained that since he had nothing to compare its size to, it must have been much further away than he had thought. The sight had certainly given Beryl a shock but also mystified her. By the time she was able to gather herself, the UFO had started up and flown out of sight, leaving no evidence on the hill or in the sky. It was alleged that the spokesperson for the Bika headquarters of a guided missile range had stated that there were no firings at the time. In addition to this, Stornoway Coast Guards received no reports of an unusual sighting or incident. It's uncertain as to what the woman had seen that day, but her description was consistent with most of the extraterrestrial aircraft sightings that have been documented throughout the years. Number 7. Paul Trent, McMinnville. Making for a hot topic in ufology are the farmer Paul Trent's UFO images from McMinnville, Oregon. Two black and white images arose in 1950. They had been taken with a simple Kodak camera by Paul, a Yamhill County farmer. It was alleged that the man had snapped these pictures on the evening of the 11th of May. These images had not been the first UFO reports in the area, but they were the subject of the most study and best photographic evidence of the existence of extraterrestrial life forms. It's believed that sightings of alien spacecraft had begun a few years prior to this, in 1947, when a salesman was flying near Mount Rainier, where he allegedly saw nine shiny saucers. For the next few days, more reports had flooded in. That same year, an Air Force colonel announced that a flight group had captured a UFO, but his superiors denied such an allegation. Thereafter, various sightings were documented right up to 1950 when Evelyn Trent, Paul's wife, had been heading back to the house. She looked up to see the metallic disc and quickly informed her husband. Paul was able to get two pictures before it disappeared, 
but he had not thought much about the incident at first. It was only when he had told a friend of the sighting that he learned that similar incidents were being reported across the U.S. for the past few years. The images would soon appear on the front of the telephone register, a local newspaper, and not long after, the national media had gotten onto the allegation as well. Evelyn and Paul became famous and were flown across the world to appear on television interviews. The images were loaned to the International News Service, which then circulated them all across the globe. The pictures then found their way into Life magazine, the largest magazine in circulation at the time, but the couple never received any money for this. The negatives were not returned to them for a good few decades before being misplaced by either the magazine or by the news service. Researchers who looked into the two photographs either dubbed them fake or authentic, and no conclusion has since come about. In 1997, the couple was interviewed again, this time by Brian Denson, who was with the Oregonian. Evelyn had told the interviewer that she'd seen a disc heading toward the house and handed a camera to her husband, who would then snap the picture. They were now living in an apartment in McMinnville, and it soon became clear that Paul was just about done with the whole story. He said to Evelyn, I told you to forget all about it, to which she responded, I know you did, before quietly saying to the interviewer, we've been bugged so much. Despite the skeptics, the couple maintained the legitimacy of their story and the authenticity of their pictures right up until their passing. For decades, the photographs have been investigated, and scientists are still quite uncertain as to what the disc is that appears in the sky and they're convinced that it's not a trick of photography. It was stated that this case is one of a few reports in which all factors had been investigated. Number 6. Nikola Tesla and the Transmitter Pictured here is an incredible image of the magnifying transmitter experiment and Nikola Tesla, who is sitting in the background. This machine emitting electrical sparks was one of the inventor's many creations. Almost all modern power distribution systems use Tesla's designs dating back over 100 years. He's the one to thank for radio transmission, fluorescent lighting, remote controls, and automotive starter coils. One of his first greatest inventions was the polyphase field, which was a generator of alternating current. With the use of a rotating magnetic field, the inventor could transfer mechanical energy into electrical energy in a much more effective way than any other generator that existed at the time. When he initially proposed the idea to a professor of electrical engineering, he was laughed at and told that the invention was a perpetual motion machine that would never work. Tesla's more extreme inventions were lost to time, and he kept important details safe in his memory. The inventor was also obsessed with resonance, causing his inventions to become more and more elaborate until he began experimenting with Earth's fundamental resonance. The experiments with the resonance of electrical energy led to the design of the Tesla coil. It was based off an already existing spark gap circuit, which would charge a capacitor from a secondary high-voltage transformer and discharge the capacitor through the air gap. A second transformer was then added to the design. The second resonant circuit was sized to be one quarter of the wavelength of the frequency desired. The resonator circuit would create another circuit that would build up potential. It was using this particular design that Tesla could make high voltages at high frequencies. By running a connecting wire to the resonator around his laboratory, Tesla was able to spread the electromagnetic energy. It was so great that it was able to power a fluorescent light bulb in his hand due to the drop of voltage through the air. Thereafter, the magnifying transmitter was born. It was the adaptation of the Tesla coil, but instead of its purpose being to discharge to the Earth, this machine tuned to Earth's natural circuit to create standing electrical energy waves which could then be harnessed by a receiving circuit. The official magnifying transmitter was an 18-story tower that was built at Wardenclyffe by Tesla, which derived from his experiments and visions in his laboratory. It was through various tests that he was able to create a method of converting direct current and low-frequency currents into high-frequency currents. This nerve-wracking picture, though, makes one think that this inventor is going to get an electrifying shock. Number 5. Mickey Mouse These creepy-looking sketches are actually the first drawings of the much-loved famous Disney character Mickey Mouse. In these sketches, it appears that the mouse had a longer nose pointing downward, which luckily didn't make the final cut. Walt Disney had written the following in a 1948 essay called What Mickey Means to Me, saying, He popped out of my mind onto a drawing pad 20 years ago on a train ride. In the same essay, Walt refers to a disaster that surrounded the theft of his cartoon character Oswald the Lucky Rabbit at the hands of Charles Mintz, a universal distributor. The Walt Disney Family Museum in the Presidio of San Francisco holds a variety of artifacts from the life and career of Walt Disney. Among items including photos, animation cells, miniatures, videos, and other memorabilia, the museum's most cherished possession is this page of sketches, which are said to be the earliest known sketches of Mickey Mouse. Marina Vallard Delgado, the director of exhibitions and collections at the museum, explained that the drawings were done in 1928 and the first idea for the name was Mortimer Mouse. Walt's wife, Lily, 
disagreed with the name, stating that it was no name for a mouse, and proposed the idea of Mickey. All the artwork is kept in the collection area of the museum and has some of the rarest and most fragile features. The humidity and temperature here are maintained in a way that all the objects can be preserved. Most of these items are donated by the family and are cataloged as they come in. No item in the museum is as important as the original Mickey Mouse sketch. It was the beginning of it all. The sketch was rediscovered in the vault belonging to the family in the 1990s. Delgado explained that the original would be up for a few months before being replaced by another piece they call a cleanup. This is an exact replica of the drawing that was created from the original sketch at the time of its production. The original includes marks and annotations as well as a large circle drawn in blue graphite, which symbolizes the final decision on Mickey's form. Number 4. Jack the Baboon. This rare photo shows a railway signalman, James Edwin Wide, and Jack the Baboon. In the 1880s, James, an amputee, was visiting a southern African market when he witnessed something quite curious. It was a Chakma baboon driving an ox cart. He was so impressed by the primate's skills that he bought him and named him Jack. The baboon would become his pet and personal assistant. James certainly needed the help after a work accident left him without his limbs. The first thing that the man taught his new primate companion was to push him in a trolley to and from work every day. Soon after that, Jack would be doing household chores, including taking the trash out and sweeping the floor. But it's the signal box where the baboon really shined. While trains approached the rail switches at the station located along the Port Elizabeth Mainline Railroad, they would emit their whistle a certain number of times to alert the signalman of the change. By watching James, the baboon quickly picked up on these patterns and eventually started to tug on the levers by himself. His master would begin to train him by holding up one or two fingers, and the primate would pull the right lever. Initially, he would look to the man for confirmation but soon needed no guidance at all. This led to newfound freedom for the actual signalman, who was able to just lay back and let the primate handle the work. While operating the lever with each approaching train, Jack would also catch the various offerings that would be tossed to him by the passing passengers. The story states that one day, a train passenger, described as posh, was staring out the window when he saw that it was a baboon who was manning the gears. He quickly complained to the railway authorities, but instead of firing Jack, they decided to test his abilities, and the result astounded them. A railway superintendent, George B. Howe, exclaimed that the baboon knew the signal whistle just as well as he did. Howe also wrote of the fondness that the creature had for the man. Upon his visit, James had sat in the trolley with Jack, arms around his neck, and one hand stroking the man's face. Jack's talents spread quickly through the town. Passengers and railway workers were amazed to see this baboon working with humans, and he soon became a celebrity. Crowds would stand around and marvel at his abilities, and his story was even featured in the local newspapers. This recognition turned the creature into a symbol of inspiration. His efforts did not go unnoticed either. It was found that the baboon was given an employment number and a salary of 20 cents a day. He was also equipped with an official signalman uniform and a small signalman's hat. This gesture underlined the trust that the community had for their non-human colleague. In 1890, he passed away after having worked the rail for nine years without making one mistake. Upon his unfortunate passing, James was inconsolable. Howe had also detailed how the goodbye between the pair had gone. Upon his visit, he'd gone up to the baboon to shake his hand, and Jack gazed up at the man, gave him his paw, followed by a grunt. The pair of them disappeared into the darkness. Jack's remains were donated to the Albany Museum in Grahamstown, South Africa, where he is on display. Additionally, there's a dedicated wall at the railway which stands in honor of the baboon and his human partner. Number 3. Almaty, Kazakhstan. This picture comes from Almaty, Kazakhstan, and reveals just how polluted the area is. The smog is the result of a temperature inversion, where various factors may cause the warmer air to rise above the colder air. The colder air, mixed with the pollution, becomes trapped beneath the warmer atmosphere. Almaty is the largest city in Kazakhstan, whose citizens struggle for air. The smog has become an almost permanent feature that mars the view of the snow-capped mountains. It only took a quarter of a century of urban planning to lead to the erosion of greenery. It took only that long for the air quality to become dangerous. The erosion gave way to a proliferation of large buildings that ultimately disrupted any natural ventilation, trapping the pollution that's been turned out by the growth of vehicles emitting harmful fumes, which now clog the roadways. The causes of such great air pollution include the heavy industries and stations that use coal, residential buildings that use solid fuels and heating stoves, and outdated transportation that does not meet emission standards. The city is one with the highest number of cars, 
which was found to be around 470,000 at the end of 2019. As more people move into the area, there will be an increase in urbanization, which inevitably brings in more cars and energy that's needed to sustain these citizens, further negatively impacting the environment. A timeline from 2019 reveals where the pollution is coming from. On the 8th of November in 2019, it was found that air pollution was being caused by factories, which posed a great threat to public health. Mining and the processing of mining resources, oil and gas were also to blame, along with gasoline and diesel vehicles. On the 7th of September in 2020, the main source of air pollution in Almaty came from the emission of a coal power plant and intensified traffic. What made this worse were the buildings that blocked the flowing winds. The city was looking into modernizing its thermal power plant, and in the same year, 250,000 trees were being planted. During the quarantine period, pollution had fallen, but the airborne levels of toxic chemicals were on the rise, passing far above the World Health Organization limits. On the 3rd of October in 2021, it was recorded that a positive trend had been outlined in the Environmental Code, which is the management of payments that come from the local budget as a pollution charge from the factories. 100% of these charges are used to finance activities aimed at improving the ecological situation, which includes the air quality. On the 28th of March in 2022, the New World Bank reported that the largest source of air pollution with fine particles was coming from dispersed residential heating stoves as well as boilers. As per the IQ Air, the air quality monitoring platform, PM 2.5 concentration in the city often exceeds the World Health Organization ambient air quality guidelines by 17 times throughout the course of winter. PM 2.5 refers to fine particulate matter, which is defined as being 2.5 microns or less in diameter. This reading for Almaty is currently at 2.5 over the guideline value. The air quality index is currently at 52, and the air pollution level is moderate. It's suggested that citizens living in these conditions should reduce their outdoor exercise, wear a mask outdoors, run an air purifier in their homes, and close their windows to prevent the polluted air from entering their homes. Number 2. The Kang. Pictured here is a prisoner whose punishment was public shaming in the form of the Kang. This contraption is referred to as Jia or Lai in Chinese, and is thought of as an able app pillar. They are carried around by offenders who have been convicted of petty offenses. The Kang is a square wooden collar that weighs between 20 to 60 pounds. The prisoner's head is placed through the central hole for the period ordered. The offender must wear the item both during the day and at night as he's left exposed in the street. A paste is used over the fasteners so that no one is able to liberate the condemned individual before their time is served. Generally, such punishment would last anywhere from two weeks to a month. The contraption usually spans from three to four feet across, so it's rather difficult for the convict to feed himself or even lay down and must rely upon family, friends, or passersby to give them food. The Kang has also been referred to as a yoke, and is made from a large wooden board that's held together by iron alloy pins or fasteners. Archaeologists have discovered remains of these objects, some of which have handwritten Chinese inscriptions. The writing is in black and red ink on paper that surrounds the hole through which the villain's head goes, indicating that it was used in Shanghai from the eighth year of the Kangxi period in 1669 onwards. Many criminals would be confined to this form of punishment but would be released within a short time, either ten days or more. The Manchu refers to a member of the Manchuria who had conquered China, where a dynasty was established in 1644. Through various periods, the jurisdictional system operated with different regulations for the Kang sizes. During the Northern Dynasty period, only rebels had to wear the heavier devices. But during the Northern Qi Dynasty, this only applied to convicts who were sentenced to penal servitude. In Northern Shao, criminals who were going into exile were required to wear it. The device that this convict was wearing was not the only type of Kang of this period. Another type was the barrel-shaped Kang, where the convicts were placed inside the barrel with only their heads sticking out. Another type had two holes for the convict's heads, which was called a double Kang. On either end of it, the names of the criminals would be inscribed. During the later periods when these contraptions were used, the legal system discerned between different weights ranging from 15 gene to 25 gene. The Kang was also lengthened, becoming 5 to 6 chi long. During the Ming period, this device was worn for much longer, anywhere from a month to half a year, and in the rarest cases, for the rest of the convict's life. The Qing dynasty adopted the system but as a surrogate for other punishments such as exile, penal military service, or servitude. During this era, the creation was as heavy as 70 jin, which was later reduced to just 25 jin and then raised once more to 35 jin. During the Qing period, this form of punishment was abolished altogether. Number 1. Stefan Pryl and the Invisibility Machine Pictured here is the Hungarian engineer named Stefan Pryl. Pryl was known as the Invisible Man, 
after he invented a machine that was said to turn people and objects invisible. The picture was taken in Hungary in 1935 by an unknown photographer. Other images connected to this engineer are stamped as the 1st of April 1935 in the archives of a famous newspaper called El Mundo, but this was no April Fool's joke. Pryle was said to be an occultist who gave the journalist an invisibility demonstration. He placed three objects in his machine, which included a teddy bear, a bronze statue, and an opaque china vase. The machine was a wooden box fronted by a picture frame and behind it a slanted object. Coming out of the rear were a series of electrical cables connected to a supply, but unfortunately, the images that showed the objects fading have mysteriously disappeared. Pryle would later demonstrate how he could make a pack of cigarettes and a picture of a woman disappear. He placed it in the box and invited onlookers to watch the show. These objects would disappear and reappear once more. He even had the guests handle the objects to demonstrate that they were real. He maintained that his invisible rays were responsible for this effect. Modern mechanics stated that Pryle was an optics professor, suggesting the idea that he was a university teacher. It seems unlikely, though, that such an institution would be favorable to one of their staff touring for 18 months. The electrical engineer claimed that his invention was not just a mirror trick but was a real discovery that he made about light rays. In one of his shows, he even vanished and then brought back a dog. There was some pulling of levers which were connected through wires to the apparatus. Some suggested that they could hear the dog bark, proving that it had gone through a trapdoor, but it can be argued that the dog was just invisible, meaning that it was still able to make a sound but couldn't be seen. At one point, a living person volunteered to be vanished by Pryle. He asked her to speak once she was invisible, but there was silence. He then walked over to the chair that she was supposed to be sitting on and waved his hand over the area, and there was no resistance. A police investigation was carried out to find the missing woman. Through the investigation, it was found that the man had no assistance and there was no one backstage. The invisible man was also mentioned in a Scottish newspaper, the Dundee Evening Telegraph, page 8. It was stated in the article that he made objects of stone, wood, and even a volunteer's hand become entirely invisible by turning on a current. The objects in the wooden box would gradually start to fade away before becoming invisible. One is able to touch the objects during the process, but their hand too will become invisible. In one demonstration, a volunteer was able to hold the objects in the box while Pryle pulled levers and pushed buttons. The object in the person's hand would become dim and blurred before disappearing entirely along with the hand that held it. An onlooker placed his hand inside, and sure enough, the objects were still there, but they couldn't be seen. It was stated that the engineer had accidentally stumbled across this phenomenon while experimenting with mercury vacuum lamps in a laboratory in Budapest. He discovered that when objects were subjected to rays, whose nature has gone undetermined, they would become blurred and fade and then vanish. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.